Now, I want to welcome you all to uh, week seven of uh, the miracle of mercy. And since it's Mother's Day, I want us to look at showing mercy in your family, uh, in your home. If you'll take out your message notes inside your program, you know, the sad fact is, sometimes the hardest place to show mercy is at home with the people you live with all the time. In fact, we're often harder on ourselves harder on our spouse, harder on our children than we are on total strangers. What's wrong with that picture? That often we are more ungracious to our own family than we are to total strangers. Have you noticed this? You could be in a major argument in your home, and I mean it's a knockdown, drag out fight, and the phone rings and you're at the top of your voice, you pick up the phone, hello? (laughs) What just happened? So wait a minute, you could control your anger for a stranger, but you couldn't with uh, somebody you're having a, a, a conflict with. We are often harder on our spouse, on our kids, than on anybody else. I, I'm not proud to admit this, I, I, I don't like this, but it bothers me, I don't know if it bothers you, it bothers me that sometimes we say the most ungracious things to those we love the most. Does that bother anybody else? Does that bother you that, that, that uh, you can be the angriest or even the meanest uh, to the people in your life you love the most? Maybe you can identify with what David said there on your outline, Psalm 101, verse two. David says this, Lord, I wanna live. I, I wanna live a blameless life, but how I need your help, Lord, especially in my own home. Anybody want to say amen to that? Yeah, right. Especially in my own home where I long to act like I should. Now you may think you're a very loving person. And love and mercy, of course, go together. The miracle of mercy is the miracle of love. You may think, man, I'm a great lover. I'm, I'm just so full of love. I'm a very loving person. Okay, let's just have a little quiz. So let's take a little quiz right now. Um, How merciful, how loving are you with your family, really, okay? How about this? When my spouse uh, or my sibling or another family member uh, gets some detail wrong while telling a story, do I A, interrupt them and correct them publicly, or B, say nothing and let it go knowing I've done the same? Write down your answer right now. You may not cheat on this, God is watching. (laughs) All right, okay, you you know, you admit it, okay, it's more likely B, that you're not doing, it's more likely you're doing, interrupt them and correct them publicly, okay? Uh, How about this second one? When my spouse uh, or my siblings or another family member keeps making the same mistake over and over and over, Do I become irritated and angry at them or graciously forgive them and pray for them? Hmm. Okay, you're two for two right now, okay? (laughs) I I can feel the humility in your life rising right now, all right? Okay, today's Worship Together weekend. We got our students with us. Welcome junior high, senior high. I love you guys. Uh, Here's here's a good one for you. Um, Number three. Uh, When my spouse or my sibling, that's your brother or your sister, or another family member, is getting more attention than I think they deserve, do I, A, feel resentful and feel the need to bring them down a notch, (laughs) brothers, sisters, or B, celebrate with them, which is the merciful thing to do? Okay, check one of those. Some of you are lying through your teeth right now. Okay, Uh, number four. Here's the fourth question. How merciful really are you with your family? When my spouse or siblings or another family member says or does something that I don't understand, I see what they did, but I don't know why they did it. Do I assume they have their best motivation for doing it? Or B, question their motivation and think the worst. I know why they're doing that. You don't even know your own motivation most of the time. How in the world could you possibly know your brothers or your sisters or your mothers or your fathers or your wives or your husbands? You don't even know your own motivation most of the time. 
Okay, and then here's the last question. Am I more polite with strangers or with my own family? Now, we have been saying that, I, I can see you're ready for the sermon now. Okay, yeah, you're, you're okay, yeah, maybe I do need to work on this thing about mercy in my family. You know, we've been saying for weeks that mercy is um, love in action. Mercy is not a feeling, it's not an emotion, it's a behavior, it's a choice, it's a decision, it's something you choose to do, you choose to be merciful. And we've been saying for months that mercy is love in action. So, whatever is true about love is uh, also true about mercy. Now that helps us out a lot, because the Bible has a very famous chapter called 1 Corinthians 13. The whole chapter defines the meaning of real love. And in 1 Corinthians 13, it gives us 15 characteristics of real love. Real love is very different from the phony love you hear like about on the radio and songs and stuff like that. And, and if it's true of love, those same characteristics are true of mercy. They are the marks of mercy. And in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8, God gives us the 15 characteristics of real love. And unless you're doing these things, you don't really love somebody. These are the characteristics of real love. Let me read them to you. They're there on your outline. Uh, love is patient. So anytime I'm impatient, I'm being unloving. Love is kind. Anytime I'm unkind, I'm being unloving. Love does not envy. In other words, you don't want what somebody else has. Love is not boastful or proud. When I'm prideful, I'm not full of love. Love is not rude. Anytime I'm rude, I'm not being loving. Love is not self-seeking. It's not me first. Today, a lot of songs, love songs on the radio, they're not love songs. They're lust songs. Love is all about giving. Lust is all about getting. When you hear a song that says, give it to me, give it to me. If you don't give it, I'm going to take it. That's not love, that's not love, that's lust. Love can always wait to give, lust can never wait to get. And, and, and if it's all about you, uh, you know, you make me feel brand new, you make me feel like a natural woman, you make me, that's not love, that's about me. Love is not self-centered, love is focusing on the other person. And then you say, I love you because of what you make me feel, that's not love, that's selfishness. That's selfish. It's I love you if. I love you because. No, love is I love you, period. Love is I love you in spite of yourself. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not irritable or easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil. These are, this is real love. Love rejoices with the truth. You don't manipulate people when you love them. Love is always supportive. Real love always trusts. It is always hopeful. Love always perseveres, and love never gives up. Love never fails. It never ends. Now, these are the 15 characteristics uh, of love. And I was tempted uh, to, uh, to do a message on all 15 characteristics. Uh, but then I asked Kay, uh, who is a very wise woman, uh, honey, what should the mother's message be? What, what do moms want to hear? What should, I, what, it, what should this Mother's Day message be? She said, short. Because they're all going out to lunch, okay? Very wise woman, okay. Uh, so we're only gonna look at four, four of these marks of, of love uh, today. And what I've done is I've asked four moms to share their story, Saddleback Moms, that illustrate these four points. We're gonna look very quickly at four ways to show mercy to your family members. And, and in your home, okay, here they are. You might write these down. Number one, the first way we can show love in our home and in our family is by overlooking irritations and offenses. By overlooking, in other words, ignoring, not even paying attention to uh, the irritations, the offenses. You're gonna have irritations in life. Nobody has good days every day. And many families and marriages are buried with a lot of little digs and irritations and offenses. And yet the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love, real love, is not irritable or easily angered. Circle easily angered. Real love does not get angry easily. Now, anger is by far the most misunderstood human emotion. 
It's also uh, the most mismanaged of all emotions. Anger is the most mismanaged emotion uh, that we have. Now, anger is not necessarily a sin. Uh, some things, sometimes anger is the only appropriate response. There are some things you ought to get angry about. Anger is not a sin necessarily because God gets angry. God sees people getting hurt on the earth, he gets angry about it. The only reason you have anger is because you're made in God's image. There's a good kind of anger, there's a bad kind of anger. There's a righteous kind of anger, there's an unrighteous. There's, a, there's an unselfish kind of anger that's based out of love, and there's a selfish kind of anger based on you hurt my pride. And that's, that's wrong. It's not anger that's wrong, it's why you're angry and how long you stay angry. Long anger turns into resentment and turns into bitterness, and that's always a sin. But anger is a God-given capacity. Uh, when you see racial prejudice and racial profiling and bigotry in the world, you ought to get angry. When you see injustice and unfairness in the world, you ought to get angry. It, when, when you see, hear about a woman being raped or a child being abused, you ought to get angry. When you hear about Christians being beheaded by radical uh, people in other parts of the world, you ought to get angry. In fact, if you don't get angry, if you never get angry, you're a vegetable, not a human being. Anger is a part of, of human life. And some things are worth getting angry for, you get angry out of love. If you hurt my grandchildren, I'd get angry. I, I'd get angry. And uh, uh, anger is a God-given capacity, but you gotta learn to control it, and you gotta learn to use it wisely. Managed anger is an asset. Every great leader in history has learned how to manage anger, and those who didn't, it was their downfall. They didn't, and, and, and the Bible says that's the problem. Now the real problem is that a lot of you think you don't get angry because you stuff it. But that's just as inappropriate as expressing it in, incorrectly. There are two wrong ways to get angry. One is to blow up Mount Vesuvius, and the other is to clam up and, and stuff it in. Both of them are inappropriate responses of anger. Neither are correct. And you blow up your clan up. You're either the mute, you hold it in, or you're the maniac, you let it all out. You're either a skunk or you're a turtle. In life, everybody here is a skunk or a turtle. Skunks, when they get upset, they let everybody know it. They stink up the place. When a skunk gets angry, everybody knows they're angry because it smells. Turtles, when they get angry, they pull into a shell. Now here's an interesting thing. I used to do marriage counseling. What I've discovered, skunks always marry turtles. So in your marriage, one of you blows up and one of you clams up. Count on it. And neither is the righteous one. And neither is more sinful than the other one. They're just both inappropriate ways of, of dealing with anger. Love is not irritable or easily angered. The Bible is very specific about the cost of uncontrolled anger. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs it causes arguments. The Bible says it causes mistakes. The Bible says uncontrolled anger causes foolish things to happen in your life. And what is the antidote to harmful anger in your marriage and in your family? Love and mercy. The more you feel God's love and the more you feel God's mercy, the more you're gonna show God's love and you're gonna show God's mercy to other people. And love is not irritable or easily angered. The Bible says this, Proverbs 17, verse nine. Love forgets mistakes. So when you hold on to a mistake and you keep remembering it over and over, uh, uh, that's not loving. Nagging parts separates even close friends. Proverbs 19, 11, the Bible says, it is to your glory to overlook an offense. Circle the word offense. It is to your glory to overlook offense. It is to your credit. It shows your maturity if you can overlook offenses. People who get offended at everything are immature. People who don't get offended at everything, they just let it slide, they overlook irritations, they overlook ear offenses, that's a mark of emotional maturity. If you're always getting your feelings hurt, you need to grow up. You need to grow up. Because uh, uh, that doesn't mean that you, that's not legitimate, maybe they really are hurting your feelings, but. You need to learn how to overlook an offense or you're gonna be unhappy all your life. You know, when I get irritated, when I get offended, when somebody says something mean about me, nobody ever does that, but um, <laughs> you know, critics and things like that, I, I, if I start to get upset, I, I ask myself three questions. Uh, number one, 
Uh, why am I angry? You need to know why. Uh, number two, what do I really want out of this? And number three, how can I get it? And you will never get it by clamming up or blowing up. You're never gonna get what you want in your marriage. You're never gonna get what you want in your family, in your relationships, with your friends or anybody else if you use these blow up or clam up alternatives to anger. Love is not easily angered. Now here's a good verse, look at this next verse. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15. Be careful, I love this in the message paraphrase. Be careful that when you get on each other's nerves, you don't snap at each other. Look out, look for the best in each other, the Bible says. Look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. You know, if we would just memorize that verse, everybody in our church family, and we'd practice it for a year, we'd be a whole lot happier. We'd have a whole lot better relationships, better marriages, better friendships. Look out for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. Now, the first mom that I want you to hear her story today about overlooking irritations and offenses is Katie Wynn. Would you give her a warm welcome? <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. My name is Katie Wynn, and I'd like to share what I'm learning about how mercy overlooks irritations and offenses in marriage, in my marriage. I'll never forget the day three years ago when I locked myself in my room and opened my Bible searching for a verse that would tell me it was okay to get a divorce. I knew it said God hates divorce, but I was desperate and bartering. What if my husband doesn't meet my emotional needs? What if he doesn't talk to me enough? What if he says things that hurt my feelings all the time? What if we're on different spiritual paths? What if, what if, what if? After an hour of searching and being left with no out, I gave up and fell to my knees. God, please fix this. I don't know what to do. In that moment, I felt peace. I just knew it was going to be okay. God drew me near and showed me what to do as I spent daily time in the word asking him what I could do to fix the situation. The mercy I showed to my husband was to allow God to fix me. Instead of focusing on all the things I thought he did wrong, I started focusing on showing mercy in my response to him as I surrendered to God and God softened my heart. The Lord corrected my delivery of words. He knocked down walls of resentment. And most of all, he calmed waves of rage and desire for retaliation. Instead of reacting in anger, God is teaching me how to respond with mercy and to use words of mercy and acts of mercy to heal our marriage. And guess what? As I changed, it changed my marriage. The changes in me began to be mirrored in my husband. When I got word that Pastor Rick wanted me to talk about showing mercy in my marriage, I immediately assumed that my husband would not be okay with this. I, think, I didn't think he'd want me to air our dirty laundry, but he actually suggested telling our story. He only suggested that I also point out that we aren't done yet. We haven't figured it all out, Learning mercy in your marriage is a lifelong process. But that's the beauty of it, isn't it? God doesn't rush us. He merely asks us to continue to grow closer to him, and as we do, he blesses that. I stand here today still married because my husband had the mercy to forgive my ugliness and because I had the mercy to forgive his. I stand here happily married because God had mercy on me when I cried out to him to fix the mess we'd made of our marriage. Look guys, mercy is hard. As Pastor Rick just taught, mercy requires overlooking irritations and ignoring offenses. It also requires you taking the first step and being the first to show mercy. When I wanted the yelling matches to stop, I had to stop yelling first. My relationship to my husband had to become more important than my opinion. It had to be more important than being right. It had to be more important than wanting to correct him. And that's not an easy one, right, ladies? But as God's word promises, I can do 
all things, even show mercy through him that gives me strength. If I can leave you all with just one big idea today, it's this. God is a God of mercy and redemption. So if you want to redeem and restore or even just improve a relationship, stop trying to be right and start doing right, which is to humbly accept God's mercy for yourself and then humbly offer mercy in your words and deeds to those you have conflict with. If you'll do that, you'll experience the miracle of mercy in your marriage. Thank you. Great job. You know, it occurred to me while Katie was talking that of these four women who are gonna to share today, we ought to applaud the courageous husbands who let them stand up here and talk about their families. So let's hear it for the husbands. All right? Thank you, guys. Uh, uh, on April, uh, excuse me, May 21st, we're gonna do a Mercy in Your Marriage seminar. That's a Saturday morning, uh, May 21st, right here in the Worship Center. And if you'd like to be a part of that seminar, it's gonna be from nine to noon with a couple of marriage experts, Mylon and Kay Yurkovich, who have counseled literally thousands and thousands of marriages over the years, and I hope you'll be a part of that. All right, let's go to the second way. You can show mercy to uh, your family. Number two, by being kind when they don't deserve it, but they need it. By being kind when they don't deserve it, but they need it. Now, in every family, we have what I call VDPs. Now, when I talk about family, I'm not just talking about mom and dad and kids, a nuclear family. I'm talking about your brothers and sisters, your moms and dads, your aunts, your uncles. Everybody has an extended family, and in that extended family, you have some VDPs, which I call very draining people. <laughs> now, don't look at them right now, but you know who they are. Okay, uh, there are difficult people, uh, and, and difficult people are hard to work with. They're irresponsible, uh, they're immature. There are demanding people, they're pushy. They are, they are, they're self-centered, they always want everything their way. They're aggressive, they're often rude. Uh, difficult people, demanding people. There are um, destructive people. There are people who are abusive uh, in, in relationships, and they hurt everybody, and they're manipulative. And then there are disappointing people, and those are people in your family who break their promise. And they tell you they'll do something they don't, and sometimes they're disloyal, and, and, and you can't depend on them. They're disappointing. Uh, and, and how do you deal with these kind of people? The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is always supportive. Are you always supportive? You're always supportive of the people, whether they deserve it or not. Uh, you say, well, how can I be more patient? How, be, how can I be more kind? How can I be more supportive? Well, here's the, the answer, next verse, Proverbs 19, 11. A man's wisdom gives him patience. Now, here's the key. If you wanna be patient with anybody, learn more about what makes them tick. Because if you understand their fears, you're gonna be more patient with them. If you understand their hurts, you're gonna be more patient with them. Hurt people hurt people. Anytime somebody's hurting you, it's because they're hurting. We don't just automatically hurt other people. You hurt people when you are hurting. Other people hurt you when they are hurting. And if you understand their hurt, you're gonna be a lot more patient with them. You look past the anger and look at their fear. You look past their anger and you look at their pain and you go, oh, you cut them some slack. Like the people you work with, there are people you work with, you just go, that, that person's a VDP, very draining person. And, and, and if you actually knew where they've come from, you'd be a lot more patient with them. You see, when we look at people, we always go, look how far they've gotta go. But instead of saying, look how far they've come. And if you knew, well man, if I had their, their parents, I'd probably be messed up too. If I had that situation grow up, I'd probably be full of pain. I'd probably be more insecure. When you have wisdom, when you understand why people do what they do, you're a whole lot more patient with them. You're much more patient with a toddler because you understand them better than they do. And so you can be patient with them. A man's wisdom gives him patience. Now the Bible says in Proverbs 3.27, whenever you are able, 
Do good to people who need help. Circle the word need. It doesn't say do good to people who deserve help. There are a lot of people in, in your life, and particularly in your family, they don't always deserve your kindness. They haven't been kind to you. But, but you give them what they need, not what they deserve, which, by the way, is what God does with you. God doesn't give you what you deserve. God gives you what you need. That's called mercy. And when you're being merciful, you give your kindness to people when they need kindness, even though they've been rude to you, even though they've been mean. They come home, and they've had a really tough day, and they start taking it out on you, your response is to start defending yourself instead of going, they had a tough day, I'm just gonna be kind to them. They don't deserve it, because they were just rude to me. They were, I didn't cause their bad day, but they had a bad day and they're taking it out on me. And you, you just be kind to them anyway. Earlier in uh, the series, when we did the first small group, we talked about the, the Samaritan, the Good Samaritan. If you're driving down the road and you see somebody on the side of the road and they're bleeding to death, you don't go up to them and say, do you deserve my help? No, you just help them. You don't say, was this your own fault? You don't say, uh, did you cause this? You don't say, are you here legally? You don't say a lot of things. You just help them. That's called mercy. Mercy doesn't say, do you deserve it? Was it your fault? Could you help yourself? No, you just help them which by the way is what God, as I said, does with you. Now the Bible gives a lot of reasons for being kind and I won't go into all of them. I, I did a, once a study through the whole Bible. The Bible says you ought to be kind because God's been kind to you. He's kind to you every moment of your life. You ought to be kind because kindness is an act of worship. When you're kind, God says that's like worshiping me. It, kindness makes you happy. The Bible says kindness makes you attractive. Did you know that? Write this verse down. Proverbs 19, 22. Kindness makes a man attractive. So, forget the Botox, just be nice. <laughs> and you'll be a lot more attractive if you're just a nice person. If you're a kind person, you're gonna be attractive. It's why I'm just so sexy, okay? <laughs> now, kindness makes other people wanna be kind to you. The Bible says that over and over. And the Bible also says that God blesses kindness, and when you're kind to other people, God is kind to you. You say, but Rick, what about that family member who's never been kind to me? Some of you have a sibling, a brother, sister, they've never been kind to you. It's kind of like the Mary and Edith relationship in uh, Downton Abbey. You know, Mary was never kind to Edith. And, and, and some of you grew up and you had parents who frankly were in emotionally incapable of being kind to you. What do you do with that? Proverbs, 1 Thessalonians 5 says this in the Bible. Don't be hateful to people just because they're hateful to you. We'll talk about that in future weeks. Rather, be good to each other and to everyone else. I want you to hear Patricia Moore's story. Would you give a warm welcome to Patricia? Hi, my name is Patricia Moore, and Pastor Rick has asked me to come and share what I'm learning about how mercy is kind to people when they least deserve it. I grew up in a home in a military family, living in multiple states and abroad with two alcoholic parents, where there was no love shown, no kindness expressed. Instead of feeling valued, I experienced both mental and physical abuse. My mother and I never had a warm mother-daughter relationship as I grew up. Looking back, I wondered if it was because my mom was raised by her aunt who did not know how to demonstrate love either and seemed to have a lack of feeling. Then eight years ago, my stepfather passed away in Florida which left my mother alone. But mom stayed in Florida for another year until it became obvious that she could not take care of herself. My adopted brother uh, was not capable of caring for her either. But because of the painful experience in my youth, I did not want to bring her to California to live with my family. 
So my mom went to live with my sister in New York City. But it soon became obvious that my sister, who had experienced all the same hurts and rejections that I did growing up, neither intended to take care of my mother. Instead, she wanted to get even with my mom for all the years of hurt she had experienced. So my sister basically ignored our mother and neglected caring for her. One day, I received a phone call from my cousin, who lived near my mom and sister on Long Island. And she told me that my mother was not being taken care of and was losing a lot of weight. My husband said, we have to bring her to California to take care of her. No. <laughs> but in the back of my mind, I was thinking, this is not a lovable person that I want back in my life. But we made the merciful choice to be kind to someone who had been unkind to me. When my mom arrived in California, I saw immediately that she needed physical, dental, and mental uh, and eye examinations. So I began the task of making doctor appointments. Honestly, from the day she arrived, it was never my plan for my mom long term. I saw it was an emergency to help her. My husband and I downsized three times and we were enjoying being empty nesters. But to shorten the story, fast forward six years, of course, we're still caring for my mom. We've supported and sustained her through two broken hips. Each time, right before hubby and I would be leaving on a mission trip. But God enabled us both to care for my mom and to fulfill our mission commitments. About a year and a half ago, my mother had a stroke which has uh, rapidly advanced her Alzheimer's condition. We continue to care for her during my second bout of breast cancer a year ago, and even while I was going through chemotherapy and radiation treatments. In this series, several times, Pastor Rick has defined mercy as undeserved unforgiveness and unearned kindness. It is not a feeling. It is a choice to be kind, even to people who have never been kind to you. That's not easy. Now, you might expect that my kindness towards my mom would have softened her heart and maybe even given her the ability to show love back. But with my aging mom's deteriorating mental and physical health, she is not able to love back. So mercy is not dependent upon other person's response to it. It chooses to continue to show kindness and love to her because it is the right thing to do. And although I've never received the love and need from her, I am grateful that she gave birth to me that I am alive because of her. So at least I can honor her for that. I cannot sugarcoat this. Mercy is often difficult and inconvenient. I have admitted many times that I believe God sent her to me because I did not want to take care of, of her in my home. And I need to learn the lesson of mercy. And you know what? Revenge and retaliation against those who hurt you never makes you happy. I don't know who my story is intended, but I will tell you this. The pathway to peace is through the miracle of mercy. Thank you. You know, Patricia used a phrase that caught my attention in that, in that testimony. She said, 
when my stepfather died, it left my mom all alone. There are literally tens of millions of women living alone today because their husbands died. We, we know that women outlast, they outlive uh, their husbands, wives outlive their husbands in a general rule uh, because they take better care of themselves. And um, it's so common for that to happen. And it brought back kind of a very uh, embarrassing, but I'm gonna share it with you anyway, experience for me last fall uh, that was kind of a turning point for me. Uh, I was having a conversation with Kay one day and I was complaining about my physical aches and pains. And, and Kay said, you know, if you don't take care of your health, you're gonna die before me. Now, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but in my mind, I was thinking, and what's wrong with that? <laughs> Sounds good to me. I mean, I don't wanna be living here after I've spent 40 years with this woman. I don't wanna be by myself, alone. Uh, I, I'd much rather that I go first than, than, than my wife go first. And I'm embarrassed, that's what I thought. But you know, the more I thought about it, I thought, that is an incredibly self-centered thing, way of thinking. It's certainly not loving. It's thinking of me, not her. It's thinking about what's best for me, not her. It was incredibly insensitive, incredibly unmerciful. And, I, 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 and the more I thought about it, uh, the more I thought, you know, uh, I, I, I've got to change, I've got to repent. And I, I began to think about, you know, I, I saw what Kay and I went through when we lost a child. And I watched the deep, deep grief in my wife when she lost a family member. And I thought, I don't want her going through that again and losing me. And I thought the unselfish thing is for me to put up with the grief rather than her to put up with the grief. And, and so I made a commitment to her. I said, okay, I'm gonna do the best I can to get healthy, to be in shape, and uh, to not prematurely die so that uh, I'm here as long as you are here. That's an unselfish thing. And I vowed to get healthy. Uh, I've gotten healthy many, many times, but a lot of times it's for personal benefit. But this was really an act of love. It was more for her benefit. I didn't want her living by herself uh, alone. And love became my motivation. Now, it's Mother's Day, but let me just talk a minute to the guys for a second. Okay, men, dads, husbands. If you haven't got a Mother's Day present yet, mm, Okay, I give you permission to get up right now, we'll close our eyes and run to the nearest store, okay? If you haven't got a, a Mother's Day present yet, you're, you're a little behind. <laughs> but the best Mother's Day gift, dads, that you can give to your wife is this. Don't die! Get healthy. Get in shape so you don't die prematurely and leave your wife on this planet for 20 years without you. That's the loving thing to do. Did you know that 97%, this is a health statistic in America, 97% of all dads are not taking good care of their health, 97%. Now here at Saddleback a few years ago, we started the Daniel Plan. We have literally thousands of people involved in a plan to get healthy in five different areas. And when we started out, we had a good number of men uh, as well as a good number of women. 15,000 people signed up, but the men dropped out. And today, about 80% of the people doing the Daniel Plan at Saddleback are women. That makes me embarrassed for my gender. <laughs> I'm going, oh great, I'm gonna get to be the pastor of fit moms and flabby dads. So men, man up, all right? The best thing you can do for your mother or your wife this year is get healthy. I wanna see you tomorrow night, Monday night, Lake Forest campus, the refinery. I'll see you at 7 p.m. for one hour, a men-only Daniel Plan rally. We're gonna do this together, okay? So no more excuses, no more girly girl, little girly girl stuff, manly men stuff, all right? <laughs> Daniel Amen will be there. We're gonna have men who can give testimonies. All of the guys who lead our fitness 
ministries, all of our recreation ministries will be there, a lot of things, encouragement. Now, if, if you come early, we're gonna eat. But it'll be healthy food. It'll be Mongolian beef. We're going to eat at 5 p.m. Uh, and and you'll, you'll be out pretty quick. But if you can't come for that, come at 7. I'm going to see all the men. Now, ladies, don't nag your husband. Because it doesn't work. Remember, love does not nag. Okay. But if you want to do the unselfish, loving thing for your wife, uh, you need to get in shape. You need, you need to get healthy. And I'll see you tomorrow night. All right, let's go on. Third way that we can show mercy to our family members is by letting go of past hurts. By letting go of past hurts. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love, real love, keeps no record of wrongs. Do you do that? Do you keep a mental record of every wrong your husband's ever done or your wife's ever done or your parents have ever done or your kids have ever done? And you're keeping a mental record so that when you do something wrong, they go, well, you did this. Yeah, but you did that. But you did this, but you did that. The Bible says love doesn't do that. Love doesn't keep a record and store up all the bad things, the hurts, the, the offenses, so that you could pull them out as the ammunition and you can nurse yourself with them. Don't do that. Love keeps no record of wrongs. I heard a guy say one time, he said, you know, I went home last night, my wife gave me an earful, she got historical. He said, a friend said, you mean hysterical? I said, no, historical. She told me everything I've ever done wrong. <laughs> anyway. Write this down. Don't repeat it, delete it. Don't repeat it, delete it. Let go of the past hurts. Love keeps no record of wrongs. When you hold on to a hurt, you are not being loving. Don't repeat it, delete it. Now that, that means three things. It means when somebody, your spouse hurts you, you don't rehearse it over and over in your mind, but he said this to me, she said this to me. You don't rehearse it over and over and over. You don't get resentment. You don't keep bringing it back up as a relational weapon, but you did that. You don't hold it over their head. And you certainly don't tell other people about it. That's called gossip. You let it go. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love is not rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable or touchy. Love, notice, does not hold grudges. Circle the word grudges. That's interesting that rudeness and holding a grudge are in the same sentence because that's why people are rude. You know this, right? Rude people are simply reacting to past hurts. The only reason anybody's rude is because they're holding on to a past hurt. And when they're, when they're reacting to a past hurt, they can't relate to the present and they certainly can't respond to the future. They're stuck in the past. Rude people are stuck in the past and they're letting past hurts continue to hold, uh, hold them hostage. And other people, and then they come and take it out on you. That's not fair. So, as I said, hurt people hurt people. I want you to hear Rebecca Thatcher's story. Give her a warm welcome. Hi, my name's Rebecca Thatcher, and Pastor Rick has asked me to share a difficult lesson I've had to learn about how mercy teaches us to let go when people have hurt me, and also about the importance of teaching our kids to show mercy to everyone. Now, the way that the Lord has led me to teach mercy to my children has been one of the most difficult processes of my life. I can honestly say that it is the area where the Lord has most radically changed my heart since I have chosen to follow Jesus. In 2008, my world completely fell apart when I discovered my husband was having an affair. At the time, we had four daughters under the age of five. To say that I was deeply hurt and angry was an understatement. I'm not gonna lie, at the time, I absolutely hated that woman for what she did to my family. That affair did break up my marriage and ended in divorce, which left me a single mom with four tiny daughters. What kept the pain going was that my ex-husband began to slowly and surely introduce this woman to my daughters. There were times that I thought I would go nuts from frustration and from anger. How could he do this? How dared this woman have a relationship with my precious daughters? I'm fairly sure I didn't stop crying for about a year as I adjusted this new normal. Then four years ago, 
the Lord brought an unbelievably amazing man of faith and integrity into my life and the life of my daughters. It was really hard to trust again. I'd been holding on to the pain and the hurt, but by God's mercy, I began to let it go. And within a year, I became his wife. And with him, I gained a stepson. And he gained four stepdaughters. <laughs> what was really helpful was during our engagement, we took step family life classes here. And we really felt that the step family ministry had totally prepared us for step family life. We were ready to take this on. We felt confident going into our new family dynamic, but nothing could have prepared me truly for the reality of life as a stepmom. I didn't understand what a challenge it would be to parent a child that was not my own. We know that 70% of all step families end in divorce in the first two years, and I can see why. Step family dynamics are incredibly, tremendously difficult. Blending two family cultures peaceably is almost impossible without Christ right at the center and without an incredible support system like we found here in our church family. We had the support, but even with rock solid faith, it was really rough in the beginning. And just when I thought things were settling down, shortly after I married my husband, my ex-husband married the other woman. Now that's messy. She would be the stepmom to my daughters. But you know my heavenly father, he's been preparing me for this incredibly confusing season by making me a stepmother first. God truly transformed my heart with his mercy by helping me to see the girl's new stepmother in a really different light. As I walk through my own personal difficulties, trying to figure out just where I fit into my stepson's heart and into his life, I was now able to see this woman through eyes of mercy and empathy instead of anger and judgment. Step parenting is often said to be a bankless job, because it is. My ex-husband's wife is not just co-raising one stepchild like I am, but four. So when I see her sitting in the rain at my daughter's track meet for hours, yes, I'm going to thank her. That's letting go of past hurts. With eyes of mercy, I see and I truly appreciate all that she does for my girls. And no matter how unreceptive they might be, I want her to know it. My girls can't always understand why I choose to champion someone that I'm supposed to detest, someone that they do sometimes have a hard time relating to, but I know they hear me. Do I still get frustrated with our co-parenting situation? Of course. I want us to have a healthy family dynamic with them because it's what's best for our children. But in the meantime, the Lord is busy sanctifying me and helping me to practice mercy daily when every fiber of my being wants to do otherwise. Why do I practice mercy? Well, I know it's what God wants me to do, and I also know it's setting the example of mercy for my girls, who will face many hurts of their own in their lifetimes. I don't want them to get stuck in bitterness any more than I was, and I pray that my example will inspire them to do the same one day. In closing, I don't know who's hurt you. I don't know how they've hurt you. But I do know the antidote to that pain is mercy, and I hope you'll try it. Thank you. If you are a step parent, I highly urge you to take advantage of all the Saddleback step parent resources. We've got classes, we've got courses, we've got support groups. You can go out to the patio after this is over to the small group table and get information on all of our small group ministries and our step group ministries. Uh, now, the fourth way, real quickly. Fourth way you can show mercy to a family member is by believing God is working in their lives. By believing that God is working in the lives of other people. You must believe that God is working in the life of your spouse, even when you don't see it. You must believe that God is working in the lives of your kids, even when you don't see it. You must believe that God is working in the lives of your other family members, your parents, even though you don't see it. You trust, you believe, faith and mercy and love and grace all go together. The Bible says that you have to trust God. 1 Corinthians 13, verse seven. Love always trust. Doesn't just trust other people, trust God. 
Love always trusts. Love is always hopeful. Not hopeless. Love is always hope-filled. And love perseveres through whatever comes. Now, how do you know if you're trusting God for your marriage? How do you know if you're trusting God for your family? How do you know if you're, you're putting your faith? Love always trusts. Love is always hopeful. Love always believes. How do you know if you're trusting God for your marriage and family? Real simple. Look at how much you pray about it. If you pray about your marriage and your family a lot, you're trusting God a lot. If you pray about your marriage and your family a little, you're trusting God a little. If you're not praying at all for your wife, your husband, your kids, your family, your parents, you're not trusting God at all. It is, is very clearly seen in your prayers. And that's why the Bible says in Psalm 28, Lord, hear my prayer, hear my prayer for mercy. When I call you, when I call to you for help, when I lift my hands toward your most holy place. Last story, would you give a warm welcome to Carol Picatus. Picatus. Hi, my name is Carol Picatus, and Pastor Rick has asked me to talk about what I'm learning about the connection between prayer and mercy and between faith and mercy. In the fall of 2009, God started me on a journey of mercy when my youngest child, Nathan, was diagnosed with stage four cancer at age 11. It was, of course, an incredibly difficult time facing the vast unknown that a disease of this magnitude can bring and also facing the horrible treatment that he had to endure for three years as a young boy. It was truly a family crisis. My family and I had absolutely no way of knowing what the future would be like for Nathan or for us. So we were forced to learn how to rely on God's mercy and grace on a day-by-day -day basis, but mostly on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. The Bible says love always trusts, always believes, and is always hopeful. So I had confidence that my child would be healed. I just didn't know if it would be here on earth or in heaven. Faith in God's mercy is comforting when you know the future. As I turn to God to receive his overflowing grace and mercy. resources that I did not have on my own, and I was able to pour out mercy on my very ill son and our two other kids who were deeply stressed by their brother's illness. Through this very difficult time, God taught me an aspect of showing mercy that has been priceless to me and that might surprise you. When we typically think of mercy, we think of doing kind things for others in tangible ways. You can see these visible acts of mercy. And of course, I was able to do many of these during Nathan's battle for survival. I'd make his favorite foods and let him eat in his room. I'd distract him from his pain and nausea by watching movies or playing games with him. I'd take him fun places as often as he was able to go so we could share some fun and laughter. But there were the endless doctor visits and I'd have to take him to the ER in the middle of the night. I'd advocate and do anything I could help anything I could to help him get better. These were all visible acts of mercy. But I believe the most power, profound way God taught me to show mercy was to pray for Nate. There was really very little I could do in his physical battle with cancer. 
I could not make his extreme pain, nausea, or fatigue go away. I could not get rid of the disease. I could not make his body fight infection. However, because of the mercy of Jesus, as it says in Hebrews 4.16, I could come boldly to the throne of our gracious and merciful God by praying for him. There, our entire family could receive God's mercy and we could find the grace and strength to help us when we needed it most as a family. Just think about the power of this act of mercy. I could call upon the Lord of the universe, who is also the Prince of Peace, and ask him to do things for Nate and to show mercy to Nate in ways that were far more powerful than mine or any doctor. I could ask the Comforter to bring his comfort in a real and tangible way to my sick son. In prayer, I could ask to fulfill the promise of four, uh, Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And I could remind myself and Nate that God has promised over and over to never leave or never forsake us in our hour of need. Yes, I learned that praying for my family, trusting God, believing in his goodness, hoping in his power, and standing on the promises through prayer was likely the most powerful act of mercy I could do for my child in pain. I could believe James 1.5 where it says, if you need wisdom, ask our gracious God and he will give it to you. I'd then pray for wisdom to know the best ways to show mercy and God would give it to me and our medical team. Most important of all, and as hard as it was to do this, through praying in faith, I was able to release my son in prayer to the loving God who gave him to our family in the first place. His name Nathan, after all, means God has given. So I align my will for my son with the will of God by praying, your kingdom come, your will be done. And I was willing to trust God's mercy regardless of the outcome. I don't know why some prayers are answered the way we want and others are not. I just know God tells us to believe and pray. In this particular case, we learned God's will for Nate was to recover from his cancer, and today he's a senior in high school and on his way to college in the fall. <laughs> but even if the outcome had been different, my prayers for my child in pain were acts of mercy and I have no intention of stopping them. You know, sometimes we treat prayer as a last resort rather than our first choice in showing mercy. In times of tragedy or fe fearful circumstances, we often hear people say, well, all we can do now is pray, as if that's the last straw or option at showing mercy. But through this ordeal, I have learned that prayer is the best thing we can do in crisis or tragic loss, or even ordinary daily circumstances. In closing, if you are not praying for your kids all the time, or your spouse, you're missing out on the greatest influence for good in their lives, and, most, and the most powerful act of mercy you can do. I hope you'll make it a priority. Thank you. Now this weekend we heard four different moms, very unique moms, with four different family crises. But the solution was always the same, regardless of the problem in the marriage or the family. Throw yourself on the mercy of God. Cast yourself on God's love and God's mercy. Now I don't know what crisis you're going through right now. Some of you may feel a little hopeless this morning. Some of you are students in junior high, high school, college, and you're feeling hopeless at school. You need to do what these moms did with their family problems. You need to turn to God's love and God's mercy. There was a guy in the Bible who did this. His name was Jeremiah. His life fell apart, but he did not give up hope because he turned to the mercy of God. Last verse on your outline. Jeremiah says this. I will never, I will, I will never, never forget this awful time that he was
as I grieve over my loss. Yet I still dare to hope. I still dare to hope when I remember this. The unfailing love of the Lord never ends. By his mercies we have been kept from complete destruction. Great is his faithfulness. His mercy begin afresh every day. That is the source of hope. Now these four things that God expects you to do with your family, God does them with you every single day of your life. God overlooks and forgives your mistakes, your sins, your offenses, all the things that you do that offend him, he overlooks and forgives them by his mercy every day of your life. God is kind to you when you need it, but you don't deserve it. God wipes out and forgets all the things you've done wrong when you put your trust in Christ. He wipes it out, forgives, and he forgets. And God is working in your life even when you don't feel it. This Mother's Day, you need to accept the mercy of God in your life. Let's bow our head for closing prayer. Pray this prayer. Dear God, I need your mercy. I can't be merciful to others in my own power. I need you to be merciful for me. Thank you, Jesus Christ, that you overlook and you forgive all of my offenses, offenses and my, my sins by your mercy. Thank you, God, that you are kind to me when I need it, not when I deserve it, because I don't. Thank you, God, that you wipe out and you forget my past sins when I put my trust in Jesus Christ and what he did to pay for my sins. And I want to accept your grace today. I want to accept your mercy today. Thank you, God, that you've been working in my life even when I didn't know it. I want to get to know you better. I want to learn to love you and trust you and to be a merciful person. In your name I pray, amen. Hi, I'm Jay Cranda, the online pastor here at Saddleback Church. We're so glad you joined us to watch this message today. At Saddleback, we believe that life is better together. That's why we want you to get connected to our church family, whether in person or online. We have campuses all over Southern California and on four continents all around the world that would love to welcome you to their weekend services. You can find a campus near you at saddleback.com slash locations. And if you're not able to attend a campus in person, don't worry. We have an online community designed just for you. You'll have an opportunity to connect with the messages each week and find resources to help you grow your faith. Thanks again for watching, and we look forward to welcoming you into our church family.